Anyone who couldn't preach behind that wouldn't be called to preach, would they? <laughs> Wonderful, beautiful, well done. Certainly appreciate that in my lovely brethren. And I was just inquiring about him how close he was for the next meeting. <laughs> but uh, I think he's from, I didn't get it just right, from another province or something. But that's really fine. So thankful that God has given this brother this lovely talent to sing his praises. You know, it, it all goes to make the gospel. I was preaching the other day down in the States there on four ways of seeing God. You know, and there's a thousand ways of seeing God if we just look around. He's, he's everywhere. Now, we're sorry that we kept you so late last night when it was awful hot in here. Some of the friends that's with me said, they was just fanning away. <laughs> um, so I, and then someone said, that doesn't bother the Indians, though. So they stay right there all night, testify the rest of the night. <laughs> so, so I'm grateful. Maybe when I go, just get up and start testifying, telling about what the Lord did for you. I mean, you ever hear of Tommy Osborne? He's a very precious friend of mine. And he goes to the old country much over across the seas, missionary. And he said, one time I was going to, I was on my road to South Africa. And he came to the meeting. And, and when I walked out on the stage at New York City, that place where they do all that wrestling, a big arena there, and the place was packed out and jammed together. And I was walking out across the stage and Tommy come run over and grabbed me around the waist and started hugging me. And I said, Tommy, what you doing way up here? I said, just say, Farewell to you and ask God's blessings on you while you're gone overseas. He's one of my converts to Christ in the healing ministry. And he said, um, and I said, I guess you're wore out, Tommy. You've been preaching so much. I said, no. I said, I don't have any discernment. I have to get wore out. I said, you know what I do? I just stand there for 15 minutes and tie the devil up in a knot with a word. I said, he can't get out of it. Then I have them pray for one another, and they get me a chair and sit down and listen to them testify till daylight. He said, <laughs> said one will get up and testify and tell us what God did for him, and so that makes the other one believe, and he gets up and testify while he's testifying, and the other one's getting up. And said, so I just sat there and clapped my hands and have a good time. Oh, my. It's wonderful to see how God has his different ministries. You see how he works it? This lovely brother here singing, that's a ministry of song. And others has a ministry. See, God has set in the church predestined gifts. One of them is, first is apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Now, apostles is actually what we would call today, we give them a new name, missionary. A missionary is an apostle. Now, the word missionary means one that is sent. And the apostle means one that is sent. The same thing. But how they ever wanted to be called apostles or missionaries instead of apostles, I don't know. But a missionary must have the call of God and sent of God. One sent. A prophet is a seer who sees the people's hearts and foretells the things that's coming to pass. And, and now there's a gift of prophecy. That's in the church with the local members. It falls upon any of them. They give a prophecy. Then it cannot be received to the church until it's been judged by two or three witnesses. And then they have to put their seal on that to say it's of God. Then they have to watch to see if it happens. Then it may never fall on that brother or sister again. It may be on another one. That's a gift of prophecy. But a prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, is born a prophet. Always from, uh, was ordained that before the world ever even began, see. Now you take like Jesus Christ, the king of prophets. He was from the Garden of Eden, the seed of the woman, prophet. And Moses was born a proper child, a prophet. John the Baptist, well, Isaiah saw him 712 years before he was born and said he's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. 712 years before he was born. Jeremiah, God said before he was even formed in his mother's womb, that he knew him and sanctified him and ordained him a prophet to the nations. See, prophets have the word of God and are born a prophet. 
a gift of prophecy is different. That's a gift. That, now, these nine, these five ordained gifts in the church, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. Now, that is the five gifts that God places in the church by his foreknowledge. Then there's nine gifts that's locally in the church, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and gifts of wisdom and knowledge and, and prophecy and so forth. Them nine spiritual gifts that operates through the church, but then there's nine, five office gifts that God puts in the church. And oh, how we love to see them all operating in the one of them is the pastor, teacher, and those things. Then the others comes along in confirmation. Gifts are to magnify. And God's just got it so even a, a fool will not be excused, will he? Yeah. It's so simple the way God has made it. And I like that. The more simpler you become, the greater you will become before God. That's right. Don't never try to lift yourself up. When you do, you're bringing yourself down. See, he that exalts himself shall be abased. Not long ago, I was... Am I doing something wrong here, brother? Oh, thank you. Um, that's, thank you. I probably wasn't sounding right back there. Um, they was... Um, recently, I was in... The people had sent me a letter, come to a great rally in a great city in the United States, Chicago, to a Pentecostal rally. Well, I, I, I couldn't go anyhow, but I hadn't answered the letter back, and uh, the man that was in charge sent me word, don't you come. Well, I well, that's all right. So then they got some great minister that had a great name, and my, how he was some big Bible school teacher. And when the man come up that night, he had a great big book, had pages, and he gave that intellectual talk as he read it from the pages and turned it back, a very fine intellectual talk, see? But the saints of God just sat still. It wasn't going over. He knew it. When he got up, chest swelled out, collar turned around, you know, and all this to do, and he found out that that didn't go with the people of God. And... We, when he seen it didn't go, so he just closed up his books and walked back down with his head down real humbly, walking away. There's an old saint sitting back in the corner, punched the other, and said, if he would have went up the way he come down, he'd have come down the way he went up. <laughs> That's about right. Humble ourselves before the Lord. That's the way to do it. And I was just thinking, when I was sitting out there... Uh, drove up and listening to Brother Borders finish up his uh, message, I was thinking about uh, the my Indian brethren. I hope this is all right. I remember in Phoenix, Arizona, we had a, a, a circus tent, and I was having a meeting there, and there was a, an Indian came in from, I think he was a, a Navajo. And um, he come in, very typical Navajo, you know, with a blue bands wrapped around his head and scarlet shirt on. And he didn't sit down in the seat. He just sat right down on the floor. And so uh, Billy had been giving out those prayer cards and uh, coming down, mixed them up and handed them out to the people. And um, when he would, people come up on a platform with a toothache and the other one had maybe, it uh, had, uh, uh, you know, a tummy ache or something, other, some little, a minor something. And I said to Billy, I said, son, quit giving them cards out to them people with nothing but just toothaches when there's people sitting there with cancer dying. They must get on the platform. Ask the people what's wrong with them and then give them a prayer card. Somebody gets something up there that's dying because they just got one more night and we got to close and these about 5,000 people there to be prayed for and they, they're real sick. So Billy got up on the microphone. He said, daddy said, just give these cards to the people that's really sick. He said, now, when I give my to you, you tell me what's wrong with you, and I'll give you a card. And he said, this people has got toothaches and so forth and things like that, They're having little headaches. Of course, that's a big problem to them, but it ain't a problem like a man dying and heart trouble or, or something real bad. So I'm going to call him chief. He was sitting over in a corner on the dust on the floor, and he walked up to Billy, 
patted him on the back, <laughs> held out his hand. Billy said, Chief, what's wrong? He said, Daddy told me to ask what was wrong with the people. He said, me sick. He said, how are you sick, Chief? He said, me sick. Billy said, well, I, I don't know what to do. He said, all right, you sit down. I'll get to you in a few minutes. He watched him. He and with the eyes watching. When that little bunch of cards got pretty low, he walked up and tapped him again and said, me sick. <laughs> so Billy said, Chief said, you'll have to tell me what's wrong. We did Daddy said just to give these cards to people that was real sick. What's wrong with you? How are you sick? He said, me sick. <laughs> Billy said, all right, chief, you take this and ride on it, me sick. <laughs> so it happened to be, he got in the prayer line the next night, the following night. So he come up there. Of course, the Lord began to speak, tell him what was wrong and what so forth. And so um, I said, chief, yep. I said, um, you believe the Lord will heal you? He looked at me. I seen he didn't get it very good. See? I said, do you believe the Lord will heal you? He said, At right. And I said, um, Will you be a good boy afterwards? He said, At right. And everything I said to him, he said, At right. Come to find out, there's only two words he could say. He learned that, me sick and at right. <laughs> <laughs> I met him about, oh, six or eight months later down there. I said, There's that Indian brother. I went over to him. I said, How are you, fella? Like that. He said, at right. <laughs> Someone, the missionary out there said he was healed. See, he was healed. And that's all he knew, at right. <laughs> that's all you have to know. That's right. <laughs> so we are very grateful for that simple faith. The only thing you have to know is, that's right. <laughs> when we talk about the Bible, that's right. A Chinaman one time, there may be some Chinese here tonight, he said, you Americans don't read right. said, you all read across the page like this. And said, I am going to read John 3.16 for you. He said, you say, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever be on him, not fair. said, you're saying, no, no, no. And said, we Chinese, we read up and down the page, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. <laughs> At right. <laughs> That right. <laughs> Traveling around, meeting different people in different nations, it's amazing. But to find out all God's children are wonderful people. No matter what language, what they are, they're all God's children and very sweet. And I, I love them all. Norwegians, Swedes, and... Finns and uh, in Finland is where the little boy was raised from the dead. You probably read the story there. And, and that's five straight times by doctor's examination that five people being dead, being by the grace of God through a vision, called their life back to them again. And that's signed doctor's statement. You, see. you read that in the Christian businessman not long ago about the little Mexican baby. Uh, that, you see, before you put anything in print, you've got to be able to prove it. See, You can say it. That's all right, because you can deny it. But when you put it in print, you better have it right. And so this little Mexican baby, the doctor signed it. It had died that morning down in Mexico there. There's thousands. Well, one altar call produced 20,000 people at one time. And this little Mexican baby, now they were all Catholic, and they were... Oh, it's such a, just, they come there at nine o'clock at morning and wait till I got there at nine that night, waiting for it to come. And I come on a platform, been raining all day, just pouring down, and they stood right there, right in that rain. Night before that, there's an old Mexican brother come across the platform, no shoes on, trousers all ragged, no hats, sewed up a twine cart, and he was coming across the platform, shaking like that. He reached in his pocket and got out uh, some beads to say a Hail Mary. And so that's not necessary. The interpreter, Brother Espinosa, some of you Assembly of God people will know Espinosa. He's with. And so he was my interpreter. And I said, that's not necessary. So he come up and I looked and there I was standing there, good pair of shoes on, nice suit. Somebody give me. And there that poor old brother was, 
didn't have no shoes, didn't have no suit. His coat was ragged, no shirt at all, dusty. Probably the old fellow never had a good meal in his life. And I just got through eating a fine meal. And remember, he's a, he's a man that Christ died for, same as me or anybody else. Got just as much right as I have. Probably a bunch of little kiddies at home, or maybe young folks then, because he had been about the age of my father, and there was totally blind. And I put my foot upside him, and the congregation couldn't see it. Oh, the platform's about as long as this building is across. And uh, I put my shoe upside of his foot to see if it would fit him. I'd give him my shoes. And I thought that his feet was much larger. And then I tried my shoulders to his shoulders. My coat wouldn't have fit him. I thought, oh, God, there it is. And I seen his gray hair hanging down, his eyes white. I thought, if I could only help him some way. You've got to feel for people or you can't do no good when you pray for them. You've got, you've got to feel for them. And I thought, what if my daddy would have lived? He'd have been about that age. He's probably somebody's daddy. And I thought, and then just think, the Satan has been so evil to him. Nature has got him in the condition he's in, probably in this poverty-stricken. And here he don't even have an uh, eyesight to see to get around. And I put my arm around the old fella. And I said, Heavenly Father, I pray for this dear old man. I looked at him standing out here in a vision in front of me. He could looking right at me. Oh, my. ain't nothing going to stop that when that vision comes. Yes, sir. I seen you could see. I just pulled him away from me like that and hollered, Glory adios. That means glory to God. There he could see as good as I could. And the next night, there was a pile of old shawls and hats that was about three foot high and about, about uh, 15, 20 yards long. How they ever know who it belonged to, I don't know. Just piled together to be prayed over. When I got to the platform, Billy... My son said to me, we had just started preaching, Brother Espinosa. I woke up. I, we've had three nights all we could be there. And I said, now I'm going to speak tonight as I did last evening, telling you all what Jesus was. And you've seen him here go out through the congregation. You've seen him restore sight to the blind. Look in there, what a pile of old crutches and chairs and things that the people sat in. I said, it goes to show that their faith in a risen Lord has did this. And... Uh, I said, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Billy come to me and said, Daddy, I've got almost 300 ushers on this side. And he said, they can't hold a little woman. And said, she's just about so high. Young woman. Said, she's got a dead baby. And she's been standing at rain out there. And said, manana, never give her manana. The word manana means tomorrow. And he was so slow that I called him tomorrow. <laughs> see, he was supposed to come at me, they said, 5 o'clock, and he'd get there about 8.30 or 9, see. And I called him manana. He said he was giving out prayer cards. Billy just had to watch that he didn't sell one, you see. That's what we have to watch. Now, uh person giving out prayer cards has a responsible job, and that's the reason I had my own son giving them out, because people could be something done bad. And so then... Um, he just watched him, and he gave out the prayer cards and said, he's give out all the prayer cards, and this little woman didn't get one. And said, them people have been standing just as far as you can see around that big bull ring there, with, uh, uh, been standing there all day, since nine, 8 or 9 o'clock that morning when they opened the gates, and this was about 9.30 that night, maybe a quarter to 10. And said, and that little woman has climbed through them ushers. She's got a dead baby wrapped up in a blanket. She wants you to pray for it. And said, she climbs over the top of their shoulders, runs between their legs, and said, we just have to get back there and kick her off the platform, see? Because I can't let her up here without a prayer card, because it'll cause a riot, you see? Because them people stood there that long waiting for a prayer card. And Brother Jack Moore, many of you all may know him from Shreveport, Louisiana. Somebody might have heard him. He's a very fine man. He was on the platform with me. I said, Brother Moore, that woman wouldn't know me. Go over and pray for the baby, wherever it is over there, and she'll never know the difference. He said, okay, Brother Brandon. He started off, and I said, now, Brother Espinosa, interpret. I said, as I was saying, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The, and I looked, and right here in front of me was a little Mexican baby sitting there, his little dark brown face, and it was laughing at me. It didn't have any teeth, just a little gum showing. Right here in front of me. I thought, wonder if that's that baby. And I stopped. I said, don't interpret I said, Brother Moore, wait a minute. I said, Billy, make a way and bring that woman up here to the platform. And uh, so they brought the little woman up, and she come up. She fell down on her knees. We're going to holler, Padre, Padre. That means father. She's Catholic, see. Padre, Padre. And I, I took her by the hand. I said, stand up, stand up. And she held her little 
little stiff baby out about this long, under a blanket, just soaking wet, or just pouring rain all day. And it's real wet. And uh, I said, uh, no English. And she kept saying, Padre, Padre. And Brother Espinosa said, told her to keep quiet. And so I put my hand on a little blanket like that, a little stiff, cold farm. I said, Heavenly Father, I don't want, I know you don't have to heal to prove yourself. You heal to fulfill your word. And I said, we all know that you're God. But just a moment ago, a vision came before me, as you know, a little baby. Was it this baby, Father? If it was, about that time I went, wah, wah, making it kick his little feet like that. And there it was alive. <laughs> and it, so I said to Brother Espinosa, I said, and she just started screaming and fell backwards like that. And, and so I said, beautiful little lady, just a little thing, about maybe in her 20s, probably her first baby. And so I said to Brother Espinosa, now don't you say nothing about that. Now see, because first thing, put a runner with a baby and find out from, let her doctor sign the statement, see, because we don't want nothing. It must be true. See, you don't want nothing. Someone reads anything, you want it to be the truth. It mustn't be something wrong because that wouldn't be right before God. And so um, uh, went, and the doctor signed the statement that the baby died with pneumonia that morning at 9 o'clock in his office. And that was at 10, about 10 o'clock that night. Been dead all that time and lives in Mexico today, healthy and heavy. Be- because Christ lives. Christ lives. And what does it take? Simple faith. I said to your pastor, Brother uh, Eddie Bisco, I said to him tonight, or this afternoon when I was speaking with him, I said, it's just too bad that we didn't have the full six weeks we've been coming up the coast to be right in here amongst the people. He said, Brother Branham, so that's not one third of the Indians. He said, they're commercial fishermen, and they're all out in these islands and out there. I said, oh my how I would like to get in a little boat and go from island to island among them. Not only that, but I noticed last night in the meeting, some of you Swedes and Norwegians and Germans sitting back there, Canadians, wonderful faith. God bless you. You're wonderful people. We have a great Savior that loves us all. And I, I am here. I could not heal you. If I could heal you, I'd do it. See, you know how to do that. If I could take, if to heal you, if I could take a, a quarter, 25 cents, and lay it on the ground and push it up and down this street all day long with my nose, and then see you get healed, I'd do it. I said, God knows my heart. Here's the Bible. And that's right. I'd do it. But that wouldn't do no good. See? But the, and now if somebody ever comes by and say, I can heal you, don't you believe that? See? Because even medicine don't heal. God's the only healer there is. I'm the Lord thy God that heals all thy diseases. When this little Canadian Donnie Martin, you know, read the story in Reader's Digest, when they brought him all the way down there, so fast that they draw to John Hopkins, Mayo Brothers and all, turned him down. And he came down to uh, Costa Mesa and was in the meeting. And the Holy Spirit spoke, uh, Reader's Digest wrote, said the, said the evangelist didn't ask the boy. He told the boy who he was, told him what he had done and where he come from and what about it. And he was healed. See, and then I was called in at Mayo Brothers for an interview for that. And they said, uh, I said, well, I, they never put a Mayo Brothers name on there, but they, they, they had the Reader's Digest and it was the father had said it. But of course, the writer wouldn't say that about a hospital and what it said. Many great, if you read the article, it said many great clinics through the United States and Canada had turned him down. And a spastic drawed up, name is Donnie Martin, October's Reader's Digest about four years ago. And then... He said, um, uh, this, little ba- this little boy, about eight years old, oh, it's a pathetic story, how his little Canadian brother come down on a sled. He said, he knowed some deaf and dumb girls that was brought to my meeting before that, and the Lord healed one, and one of them is a singer in church, and the other is a telephone operator. So it was both deaf and dumb. So he said, we're not whipped, Donnie. Let's go and tell us. And the mother and them thought they could maybe take $50, and all of them come to the United States and take Donnie to the meeting and everything else. They wouldn't even pay one of their ways on an airplane. They had to come by a bus, couldn't even come by train. And when they got there, they had to take traveler's aid to get out there to where the meeting was. And the Holy Spirit told him who he was, where he come from, and so forth. A little drawled over father holding his baby. And so then it told him exactly what would happen. The Lord healed the child to the glory of God. 
And when being interviewed on that, they said at Mayo Brothers, Reverend Branham, we don't profess to be healers. We only profess to assist nature. There's one healer, that's God. That's the best. Isn't it? See? The doctor can set an arm where it's broke, but he can't heal it. The doctor can pull out a tooth, but he can't heal where it come out of. He can cut out an appendix, but who's going to heal? See, there's no medicine that will build cells. Cells is, is uh, growth, see? And nothing can heal that. No one can, and to have growth is the multiplication of cells, which is creation. And there's one creator, that's God. See? And he has to knit that place together, put that bone together. The doctor can set it, but you see, there has to, it takes calcium, potash, and so forth to go into that bone, to mend it together. Now, if I was cranking my car out here, fooling with it and broke my arm, and I run into a doctor and said, Doc, you're a healer. Heal my arm right quick. I want to finish my car. He'd say, you need mental healing, boy. That's right. Well, if you're a healer, heal my arm. He's not a healer, see? He said, I can set your arm. God has to heal it. So then, see, the Scripture's always right. I'm the Lord who heals all of thy diseases. That's right. We're thankful for hospitals and medicine and so forth. They aid nature, but they do not heal. No, they're not healers. God's the healer. The Scriptures cannot lie, see? Now... I guess that's the reason I take so much time. You're so nice. I just stand and talk to you, and there you are. But you know what? I don't. I miss passing through this time. I don't have a little bit to stay with you, but I want to make a date with you. Can I do it, all of you? After we cross over the river on the other side and we become young men and women again, I want I want a thousand years of appointment with each one of you. We sit down by the evergreen trees and sit down there and talk. And there will come Abraham by, and we'll raise over and shake hands with Abraham. And uh, Daniel will come by, and we'll shake hands with him and jump around, shout a little bit, and sit back down and just talk about Port of Bernie <laughs> when we had the meeting here. Uh, now, that sounds like, to some people, it might be fiction, but that's truth. Amen. That's just as truth as it can be. Now, before we pray for the sick or whatever we do, and I, I want you to know that divine healing, we do not... Try to make that our great hope. Uh, Dr. F.F. F. Bosworth, a good friend of mine, just went to heaven recently, a real old man. Many of you have heard of Fred Bosworth. He's a godly, saintly old man. And he said, divine healing is just like going fishing. said, you never show the fish the hook, you show him the bait. <laughs> he grabs the bait and gets the hook. So, that's a, so about 86% of Jesus' ministry was on divine healing. It attracts the attention of something supernatural being done, and the people then believe in a mighty God. Amen. That does it, you see. So divine healing is a minor, and you can never major on a minor. That's right, Miss Bisco, isn't it? That's right. You can never major on a minor. So we have to remember that this year is just something... Now... My real way of seeing it, now we have great man in the world today, great man, Tommy Osborne and, and uh, all who all, Oral Roberts and those men, and you got great men through Canada here, goes by healing uh, with prayer, laying hands on the sick. Oh, I respect that. Oh, my. They're a man of God. Great faith to hold on. But someone wrote me a letter years ago when I first started. He said, Brother Branham? Good criticism, and I appreciate that. It makes you know where you're standing. As long as people don't get, you know, real mean about it, just wants to be a brother and tell you where you're wrong, I appreciate that. I always admire criticism, as long as it's, it's right. And then um, this man said, you know, Brother Branham, he said, Oral Roberts will pray for 500 while you pray for two. He said, you are the slowest man I've ever seen. <laughs> Well, I said, that, that's true, wrote him back. But he said, Brother Roberts, you stand up there and lay hands on him like that and pray for him as they go through and pray for him like that. And here you're still standing there dealing with one. See? I said, but you see, God gave Brother Oral Roberts a way to pray for the sick. And he gave me another way to pray for the sick. And Brother Oral Roberts does it his way that God told him. I do it the way God told me. That's right. And I said, now, here's what it is. When you're looking, what, for instance, if you've got great faith, just let me see, say something. Usually, 
Then it misses, comes in. Now I'll say, for instance, we've got great faith, and here stands the man on the platform, I, uh, having a great time shouting in the glory of God around. And I said, uh, maybe this man stole some money. He lived evil, maybe run around with some woman immorally, or he uh, had done a murder or something, and God had put this sickness on him. You know, God uses sickness for whips to bring us to him. You believe that? Sure it is. A cha- look at Job, the chastening of the Lord. Now, I have to notice, prophetic gifts can get yourself in trouble. Certainly can. Now, what if this man's done something evil, and I'm standing there, great big, uh, what we call in America, bulldog faith, and I grab a hold of him and say, hallelujah, hallelujah, Satan, turn him loose, glory to God. And I take that disease off of him, and God put it on him for a purpose. I'm in trouble with God. You see what I mean? Maybe you don't get it. Wait. Let me give you some scripture. I know you won't doubt the scripture. Here, let's take Moses. How many believe Moses was a prophet, a great prophet? Amen. God told Moses, go down there and speak to the rock. And Moses went down there and done what God told him not to do. Yes. He smote the rock. Yes. He smote it the first time, but God told him to speak to him. The rock was Christ. He was smitten once. It spoke of the, the uh, weakness of the blood of Christ. And, at the, and Moses smote it the first time. Waters came forth. Then they cried again and kept crying for more water and something else. And God told him, go down and speak to the rock. But he smote it. The waters didn't come and he smote it again. He had power to do it. He was a prophet. And the waters came forth. That's right. What did God do? He said, come up here, Moses. He said, you see the land, yonder? You're not going in. You didn't obey me down there at the rock. You remember the story, don't you? He had power to do it, but he better watch the way you use that power. Look at Elijah. He was bald-headed. And he was coming down the road, and some little children began to say, Oh, bald-head, oh, bald-head, why don't you go up like, like Elijah did, making fun of him? Now, that was all right. Them little kids, they didn't maybe... Maybe it was their parents had taught them to do that, the little fellows. They were making fun of this prophet, but they got him angry. And he turned around and put a curse on those children in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears come out of the woods and kill 42 little innocent children. Now, that don't sound the nature of the Holy Spirit, does it? No, kill them little children, see? But an angered prophet, he cursed them children. It had to be recognized because he was a prophet, see? So you have to watch. Notice in that line, I see what the trouble of the person is. Tell him, then watch over. See what he's going to say or do. See what he tells me to do. If there's something there wrong, it still remains black and dark and cold, I say, go and the Lord bless you. But then if it isn't, and I see it's being done, see him in the future, then I say, thus saith the Lord. You see, then you see it's all right, then it'll happen. Now, just pray, believe, and someday I hope to get back with you so we can stay a long time together. So if the Lord will now, I want to read a familiar little text out of the Scripture, and it's found in St. Matthew, in the 12th uh, chapter, and begin with verse 41. And the man of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, are greater than Jonas this year, and the queen of the south shall rise up in the gener- in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, I would like to take for a subject a greater than Solomon is here. A greater than Solomon is here. And for a text, recognizing God's gifts and signs. Now, may we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have just read from your Word. And you are the Word. And you've always been the Word. And now we thank thee that we have faith to know and believe that everything is running just exactly on schedule. Tonight this meeting is just exactly on time. 
And the world and all of its achievement is just exactly on time. And oh, Father, when passing through the world's fair a few days ago, looking at the achievement that man has done and how he's progressed, how the people had gathered from around the world to see what the world was doing, finding their best that they have did. Germany, England, Switzerland, the world around was displaying what they had been able to improve upon. And then, Lord, we come over to this little city, way back here at Port of Bernia, where some isolated Indians from off the island who knows what it is to thank God for a good catch of fish. Honest and sincerely who can stand on the mountains and watch the sun set and cry. Give praise to God when the birds wake at morning and begin to sing and can see God in nature and hear Him scream in the gulls and watch Him lap His great wings in the air. But we have gathered here for a spiritual world fair to see what God's been able to do with His church through the age. How He's come from, from confession to gifts and signs and speaking in tongues and wonders and now right down to the last sign. God, in His great affair, showing to the world what He's been able to do with His people. And we're so glad to be represented tonight, Lord, among a group of people that believes it and sincere and travels everywhere to find the goodness of God. Now, Heavenly Father, bless thy word. Bless thy people everywhere. Save the lost, Lord. Oh, God, they must go someday, we know. And I trust, Lord, that tonight... It'll come to pass that we will be the kind of Gentiles that Jesus admired. We read in the Bible where Jairus, his little girl, laid sick, dying. And he said, come lay your hands upon my child and she will be well. But when the Roman Gentile, he said, I'm not worthy that you'd come under my roof. Just speak the word, and my servant shall live. And you turned and looked at Israel and said, I've not found faith like that in Israel. Now, Father, we're not trying to lay hands upon the sick, that when I leave they might say that a certain brother come by and laid hands on me. But, I, Father, I pray that they will see that uh, what the motive in my heart and the objective of thy word that I'm trying to bring to them that their Savior, Jesus, is with them. He's ever living. He's alive. Two thousand years of criticism and coldness could not kill him. He's still alive right in our midst tonight. And let the people see his presence See him working, not wait to someone to lay hands upon them, but by faith believe the resurrected Christ and receive their healing and their salvation. Go up and down the islands everywhere testifying like the little lady we spoke of last night at the city of Sychar and over in the land of the Samaritans. Grant it, Lord. We are your servants, humbly committing ourselves for this text tonight. Speak, Lord. We are in your hands. Do with us as you see fit. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, in these meetings to the clergyman, I have tried to keep it very simple, just the message, and of healing so that we can uh, watch our Lord. Now, many times people go around, you know, and it's just human. They say, oh, brother, so-and-so, hallelujah. Don't you think he had a gift of God? He laid hands on me, hallelujah. 
No, that was your faith that did it. It was your faith, not the brother's hands. It was your faith. See, because if there is healing in some man's hands, then what happened to Calvary? There's where he paid the price of our healing. It's our individual faith in his finished work. Any man knows that, you see. Now, therefore, I have not come trying to say, let's all come up and let, lay hands on him. I'm trying to say this to build your faith. Now, I'm one of you, what if one of you Indian brethren or sisters who get sick way out on one of those islands, you think, well, I'm poor, ain't got no money. If I could go down to the States, go way down to Brother Branham, go way over to Oral Roberts, well, maybe Brother Roberts should probably take months to get in. I've got 300 sitting there on waiting list now from all over the world. But that's for private meetings. See, when we come in there, uh, take a case like that, we never leave it. We leave it alone until God reveals. It takes God to reveal what he must do, what he has done, and so forth like that. Now, that's private interviews. That's something in life. We got the plan laid out in the Bible here, but the private life of things, oh, it would take years. I could write volumes of book on what I've seen him do. And not one time did it ever fail. Yeah, right. Not one time did it ever fail. Just ask anybody at any place. It never does. It can't fail. It's God. There's one thing God cannot do. He cannot fail. He can't fail. Amen. Now, believe now. Now, Jesus was rebuking that generation for not believing his sign, that he had proved to them that he was the Messiah. Now, we took that last night. Now, how he was the Messiah? Because he was the Word. Is that right? Yes. Now, Messiah means the Christ, the anointed one. And then he was to be the king, the God prophet. And here was a spirit in him. Now remember, the ones who really stayed with the Scripture teaching, they recognized him. But those who went off with the other church in their traditions, they missed it. See? And Jesus told those teachers, he said, You, with your traditions, you take the commandments of God and make them of non-effect. Now what would they do with tradition today? Saying, the days of miracles is past. That's your tradition. There's no such a thing as divine healing. That's tradition. Not the Bible. I can show any man where Jesus ordained his church and commissioned it to all the world, to every creature. And these signs shall follow them and believe. Now I want somebody to show me a spot of scripture where he taken it away from the church. It's not there. It's still in the church. It's the traditions that's twisted it out. And that's the reason they didn't recognize Jesus because their traditions had twisted away and got some... They thought the Messiah would come and no doubt they built a temple and said, He'll come down the quarters of heaven. They'll beat the angelic band and He'll come in like that. And what was He? Born in a manger. In a, a, a barn where cows and uh, animals was. In a little box of straw. And was supposed to be an illegitimate birth. His mother and father not married. Oh, oh my, the devil painted a, an awful picture for him. And they said, a man like that? No. What school did he come from? Where did he get his education? Why, his daddy was a carpenter. And then say, he's the son of God. See, they couldn't believe that. But yet, he was so phenomenal until they couldn't deny it was there. And then they just said, oh, he's of the devil. And that's the same thing today. They'll class it the same way. Because wisdom is justified of her children. Did you know, as I made a remark last night, I felt it sweep over the audience and kind of had a funny feeling when it returned. But when I said education has been the mark of Antichrist all through the ages. Education is the worst enemy the gospel ever had. Listen, I'm off the subject, but just a moment. Let's just take the lineage. There was Cain... And saith, Abel was killed and Cain was brought in his place, death, resurrection of Christ. And Cain's children were all smart, intelligent scientists, all down to, to the days of Noah. And saith's children were humble farmers, sheep raisers, peasants all the way through. And it's always been that way. See? When Jesus come, the Pharisees and Sadducees and educators, look where they were at. Religious, oh, holy, my, you couldn't put a finger on their life, but 
You see, they were unbelievers. Anything that doubts one punctuation of God's Word is an unbeliever. I don't care how religious you are, Satan's religious too. You've got to believe the Word. And if you got the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will punctuate every word with a, every sentence with an amen. See? It'll never take from it. It'll believe it. See? So when Jesus came, where did he get his disciples? Did he go to Caiaphas? And I said, what's the smartest group you got? He bypassed those. They wouldn't believe him. Where did he go? He went and got the Indians of that day, the fishermen, down the river. That's exactly right. Man who couldn't even sign their own name. The Bible said that Peter and John were both ignorant and unlearned. Yeah. That's right. But they could heal a man at the gate called beautiful in the name of Jesus Christ. And it pleased God to give a man that couldn't sign his own name the keys to the kingdom, saying, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind it in heaven. Amen. Why does education play such a part today? Twisting the people away from God instead of bringing them to God. Paul, you say, what about Paul? But what did Paul say? He had to forget all he ever knowed. And he said, I never come to you with the wisdom of man, with enchanting great words, but uh, your faith would be built upon such, but I come to you in the power of the Spirit, that your faith would be in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And was saying to them, rebuking them, because they had not believed him. He said, if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe him. And here he was telling them, now remember, God in all ages has always done the supernatural because he is supernatural. Did you ever think what God was? Let me give you just a small picture now. Before I go, oh, I will get this and won't be able to. Yes, I am. I'm going to try it anyhow. In the beginning, before there was anything, it was God. Before there was a meter, before there was a light, before there was an atom, before there was a molecule, he was God. But he couldn't, he was a great controlling power of everything. And he was everything in him. Now, in him was attributes. Uh, you know what attribute means? Raise up your hand. Anybody knows what attribute? Sure, you know what attribute is. Something that it's in you, it's, it's got to display itself like an attribute. Uh, like you love uh, scenery. And when you see that scenery, something just, oh my, it just thrills you. Now, in God, he wasn't God yet because God is an object of worship and there wasn't nothing to worship him. He was God, but he wasn't God in that manner. Then he must have created angels. Then they begin to worship him. Next, he had an attribute to be a father. Next thing he had an attribute to be, to be a son. Next thing he had to attribute to be a healer. Next thing he had to attribute to be a savior. See? And all these things had to display themselves. See? And God to make a man sin so he could punish him. No, and he put him on the basis of free moral agency. And man sinned himself. And so therefore, God became a savior then. See? So it's just only the attributes of God displaying themselves that we see. And everything is perfectly on time. Every gift, everything's moving just exactly according to the tick of the watch. She, she's right there. Now, Jesus in his time, he came to display the attributes of God. In him, God was manifested in him. Notice. Now, he had showed this Messiah sign. He was unbelieving. And God in all ages has had signs to the people. And now when the people believe that sign... It was a golden age to the people. But when they disbelieved it, it was chaos to the people. Right. Now let me quote that again because I'm only going to take just a few minutes now. Look, when God sends a gift and the people believe it, it's a glorious time for the people. But when God sends a gift and the people turns it down, that generation goes into destruction. Now, Notice, what if the world today would receive God's gift? Let's go back for a minute. Noah was come with the gift of God as a prophet, saying there was coming a storm that was going to cover the whole world with water. Now, it didn't meet with scientific ideas of that day. Remember, they were greater scientists then than we are now. 
They built the pyramid and the sphinx, and we couldn't build that now. They embalmed the body to make it look natural, even to this day, a mummy. We couldn't make it. They had color in it we can't touch. They were greater scientists than we have today. And now when they probably could shoot radar to the moon, too. And Noah, this man standing out there after hearing from God and preaching, prophesying that God was going to destroy the world with water. It's going to rain down out of the heavens. Why, I hear the scientists that come up there and say, look, we've got an instrument that we can shoot plumb to the moon. You know, it had never rained in them days. God watered the earth up from the springs. Never been no rain in the skies. The earth leaning back after the antiluvian destruction causes the rains. So Noah said that it's going to rain from above. And the people didn't believe it. Science says there's not one drop of rain up there. No water. How could it rain? Noah would say, if God said it's going to rain and rain's coming from up there, God's able to put rain up there. Okay? But the people didn't believe it. One day she rained. See? And that race, because they did not believe it, they were destroyed the whole world. Years later come a prophet named Moses. Came down out of the wilderness, a pillar of fire over him. And he was bringing them the promise of God. Telling them that God had promised by his word to take them to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And he had this pillar of fire over him. And God was working with him to prove to those Jews that he was a prophet. He said, tomorrow, get everything ready because a certain, certain thing will take place. And it happened. Amen. Just exactly. He was a prophet. Notice, I thought the other day how glorious that must have been for Israel when they heard that. They believed him. Notice they were, they were slaves. They, they, they throw them out molded bread, they eat it, or done without. If those Egyptians want to take their young daughters and ravish them, what could they do about it? Nothing. If they want to take their young sons and kill them, what could they do about it? Nothing. They were slaves, and yet they were God's people. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Notice. Now, here they were, God's people in that kind of a shape. And down come this prophet with, Thus saith the Lord, according to the Scriptures, God our fathers met Abraham and told him that his seed would sojourn in a strange land for 400 years. And then he'd bring him out with a great promise and power. He would deliver him and take him to a good land where Abraham sojourned. And it, the time is at hand. Any man could have said that. But this man had a pillar of fire over him. And when he was a prophet, what he was saying was happening just exactly the way he said. Oh, my. Israel believed it. What did they do? They marched out of Egypt under that pillar of fire on the road to a promised land that they had never seen or know nothing about and none of them had never been there. But they went because God's Word bid them to go. They were in the line of duty. I hope I'm not too loud. I've been used to preaching outdoors and things. Just a minute. Notice. I'll stand back a little. Notice. They followed that prophet. Through the wilderness, and God fed them in the wilderness. He supplied all their needs, rained bread out of the heavens of the nighttime, and fed them, and took them up till they come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea was one time the judgment seat of the world. And they had a great warrior with them called Joshua. And the word Joshua means Jehovah Savior. He went out of the camp. Crossed over the Jordan. Nobody never been over there. Now, they didn't know the land was there only by the promise of God. And he crossed over the Jordan, went over into the promised land, and brought back the evidence that the land was just exactly what God said it was. Amen. See? It was there. And it was then that the people, 90% of them, disbelieved Joshua. They had to wonder a while, but God making the promise, he took them over. How lovely. They didn't have to work under Pharaoh. They could marry their wives, build them a little house on the place, raise their own f- gr- grub and stuff, and eat it, and raise their children in peace. Their nations feared them, and so forth. And then after a while, the hillsides of that lovely land become spotted with graves. Then uh, along came the greatest warrior of them all, Jesus. And he said... That God has prepared a place where there's no death. 
Amen. Where we can live forever, build houses and inhabit them, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them, and we'll not leave it for somebody else. Amen. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you and return again to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He promised it. That there's life after death. Another great Joshua. Nobody's ever been over and come back. Just another great Joshua. Notice, then, when he got to that place, he met his Kadesh Barnea, the judgment seat, for all of us, Calvary. There's where he was judged for the sins of the world. He crossed over the Jordan of death that we know it, over into the other land, died. He died so until the sun quit shining, the moon wouldn't shine, and while the earth had a nervous chill and the rock shook out of it when he died. And he died, but on the third day, he come back from across Jordan, bringing back the evidence that a man lives after he dies here. What a great warrior. Now he said, I'm going to give you the earnest of your salvation. You know what the earnest is? Is the down payment. Like if I wanted to buy a boat from one of you Indian brethren. And I went out and said, how much you want for that boat? You say, $2,000. I said, well, I'll tell you what I do. I'm going to give you $50 to hold it for me until next week. Will you do it? Hold me. Will you hold it for me? I'll do it, Brother Bram. Then you give me a receipt and I'll give you $50. Now, you can't sell that boat. Because I've got first bid on it. That's the earnest that I'm going to get the boat. It belongs to me. When well, God came back and said, Go up there to Jerusalem and wait. I'm going to send you the earnest of your salvation. And they were up there all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the earnest. Come down from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. and fill all the house where they were sitting. Amen. Now, look here. We can look back and see where we were once unbelievers. We seen once where we'd have walked around a meeting like this and laughed at it. We seen once back in our lives where we would have criticized divine healing. We one time we didn't believe in God. One time we didn't believe in His Word. But now we have been raised up from that, lifted up, died in Christ, buried with Him, raised with Him in His resurrection, and now sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Once, see, the earnest. Here we are today, in the earnest of our salvation, we stand here tonight, already dead, buried in Christ, and raised with Him, and sitting in heavenly places, enjoying spiritual things, coming back from across the way. See? Heavenly places. Oh my, it makes a shout, think about it. Like an old colored woman, a Negro woman sister, uh, said down in the States, she said, uh, Dr. Branham said, I, I just want to give a testimony. Go ahead, sister, testify. She says, I want to say this, people. I hate, that's a word to use in the sound, said, I hate what I ought to be. And I hate what I want to be. But then another thing I know, I hate what I used to be. <laughs> that's good. She knows something that happened. Amen. So do I. Every man that's born of the Spirit of God knows you're not what you used to be. Amen. I ain't what I want to be and I ain't what I ought to be. I ain't what I used to be either. See, I have raised with you. Now, I'm this high up waiting for my change to come. Amen. Now, Moses. Moses was God's servant. Now, Jesus speaking here, he said, The man of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Now, a lot of people just talk bad about poor old Jonah. And they said he was a, a backslider. I don't think so. I think the Bible said that the footsteps of the righteous is ordered of the Lord. Now, we do things that don't, we don't understand why we do it, but we just keep still as long as we're led of the Spirit, go do it anyhow. It may be contrary to our thinking, but when the Holy Spirit said go, we go. For instance, right now, I've got a meeting, we set in New York, I'd have it this week, where there was 300 Spanish-speaking people takes Madison Square Garden and seats 19,000 and wanted this very week here that I'm in here to be in New York. See? But the Holy Spirit led me over here. Seems like it'd be contrary. But I don't know why, but I'm here. You see, children of God are led by the Spirit of God. We don't understand. See? Now, the other brethren can go to them people. Now, like Brother Roberts, 
He couldn't go there. He couldn't come here. He has to have around, I think it's around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars every day. Television programs and all kinds of things and, and a three million dollar building there to operate. That brother couldn't come here. You couldn't support nothing like that. You're not a can't afford to do it. See? And neither could Tommy. And his great program with thousands of missionaries across the land, he couldn't do it. So you see, the Lord never let me grow up like that. He just let me stay so I could go in any little corner because I don't need nothing but just his blessing. I was on the field before any of those brethren. But you see, the Lord has spoke to me, said, don't get none of that. Don't get mixed up in money. <laughs> Leave it alone. I never took an offering in all my life. I've been preaching for 31 years and never took an offering in my life. See? Because, and I, hold, I held meetings as much as 500,000 in one congregation. Then I went and held a meeting where the church only see 20 people. But the Lord said, go. See? Just wherever he says, go, go. Here not long ago, you've heard of Brother Roberts, the great man. And I went, oh, he's a sweet brother, a very good friend of mine. And I went to his great big building. I went over to Tommy. And Tommy was down here at, um, at Portland when that maniac ran out to kill me that night on the platform. You've heard the story. Great big fella. And said, I'm going to knock you out there in the middle of that audience. I'll break your neck. And the Holy Spirit said, because you've challenged the word of God, you'll fall over my feet. said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over. Pulled back his big fist. And I said, come out of him, Satan. And he fell across my feet. Just exactly. <laughs> so Tommy was standing there. The police run out and said, we're after that man to put him in jail. said, is he dead? I said, no, sir. But roll him off my feet. You see, he weighed about, about over about 250. So they rolled him off my feet. And there he was. He said, is he healed? I said, no, sir. He worships that spirit. He won't. I'd led those two little police to Christ in the dressing room back there at the at Portland Auditorium. Now, now you see, in that, Tommy became a servant of God. And now he, uh, going out in the fields, done a great work. And Brother Oral, there was his great building. Well, it's a great thing to think that one man, one man could put up about a two and a half or three million dollar building. Whew, my. And look at Tom. I went in Oral's place and these 500 IBM machines running. His letters never touch human hands. If there's a machine, picks them up, writes it off, takes it down, folds it and sends it out. Goes to the bank, gets money, brings it in by a great big truck and dumps it in a, a conveyor, runs around in different languages and pull them out like that and they take care of the money. Why? It's a, you've never seen anything like it in your life. And a, it's a great thing. And Oral taking me through to show me, and Brother Fisher, one missionary with him there, and then I'd seen Brother Tommy's, his great big place over there. And I thought, how wonderful, how good. And I happened to look out. Brother, the police come up and said, Brother Bram, you can't get out that door. Said, these 50 people standing out there waiting for you. He said, they'd, they're just waiting to see. And I said, well, is your back entrance? He said, yes, go out through this way. And, I, and they said, we'll send a man around to pick you up. And I walked out in the back parking lot. I was walking up down there looking at that great big building. Oh, my. Just like i never seen anything in any part of the world like it. A little Pentecostal boy did it. I thought, isn't that wonderful? I thought, God, how wonderful. I thought, just think of Brother Tommy's place where how that great, big, almost a city block just in making books and secretaries and so forth and IBM machines running. I thought, my, I'd hate for them to come to my place, look mine over. I got one little typewriter sitting in the end of a trailer. And I wasn't trying to get somebody to help me answer my letters. And I thought, but boy, I wouldn't have all that responsibility for nothing. I ain't got brains enough to take care of that. I thought, God knows that. And I stand there, and then I got real melancholy. I got thinking, God, each one of the brothers said that they seen the ministry you gave me, and it started them on the field. I said, to that, I'm grateful. We're all working for one big place up there called heaven. And I said, I'm thankful for that. But I said, I suppose maybe you couldn't trust me, and you know what? I wouldn't be able to take up money like that, and I wouldn't have the intelligence to know what to do with it if I tuck it up. And I said, I guess it just happens to be that way. And I stand there, kind of felt a little choked in my throat because I don't say this. I just say this is the truth. I heard a voice just as plain as you hear me. said, but I am your portion. I said, thank you. I said, thank you, Lord. I'll go anywhere, any place, at any time. I want to do what, you, what you'd have me to do. And thanking God. Now, Brother Osborne and Brother Roberts and Brother, all those precious brethren throughout the world, we're all working for one place, one place. You see? And this... The little gift that the Lord gave me is to press into these little corners. You can't be all tied up with money and programs and things like that. Just press into the little corners and get the thing started. That's all. And I, I, I'm thankful for this potion. I'm so glad. He is my potion. And he's the one that I'm waiting on. Now, 
Jonah had a ticket to go down, he wanted to go to Nineveh, what God told him to do, but he went to Tarsus. Now you think, well, he'd done exactly what God told him not to do. But just a minute, if a prophet is led of the Lord, it always comes out right. Now we got out there, and the storm come up, and, and the seas got rough, and the boat was sinking, and they tied Jonah's hands together, and his feet together, and threw him overboard in the ocean, and a whale swallowed him. Now, not long ago, they had a whale laying on a, a big flat car down at Louisville, Kentucky, about 15 years ago, or maybe 20 and they was giving a lecture. And the little scientist that was giving a lecture was making fun of the Bible. Here's what he said. So now I want you people, you know, the legend. Legend, this Bible's not a legend, it's a truth. Oh, and he said the legend about the whale swallowing Jonah. He said, I want you to notice, you couldn't take a good-sized baseball and put it in the throat of that whale. So as far as that legend, there's nothing to it. This is a, a good, ordinary-sized whale. And the whale could not have swallowed a man because he wouldn't have went through his swallow. It's, at the most you could stretch it would only be about four inches if, if the man could have went through. And he could not have done it. That was just too much for my Irish background, you know. I said, mister, I want to say a word. He said, yes, sir, what is it? I said, you just don't know your Bible. I said, God said that he prepared this fish. This was a special bilk. <laughs> <laughs> See, God prepared this fish. It was a different type. <laughs> this one, this one he, could have, he could have swallowed a house if he wanted to. God can do what he wants to. The Bible said God prepared a fish. Oh, he had a big throat in him. See? And so Jonah went into the belly of the fish. And you ladies know now, when you feed your little goldfish, you know what he does? He goes right down to the bottom of the little basin and puts his little swimmers against the bottom and rests. He's got his belly full, see? He's laying there just resting. He's done prowl through the waters until he found his food and went out and rested. That's what fish does when they feed. Get a belly full, they go back. The trout out here, get under a rock somewhere and rest. That's way. And I imagine this big old fish got a belly full of this prophet. So he goes down in the water and goes down at the bottom and lays down. Now you talk about Jonah being in a condition. He was in a bad shape. A lot of people talk about symptoms. They say, well, I was prayed for last night, but... I still got the pain. I don't have nothing to do with it. I was prayed for my hand still crippled. That don't have nothing to do with it. If you believe it, you don't look at that. You look at a promise. See? You're not looking at the hand. That's what we call symptoms. Looking at symptoms. Now, there's nobody in here could have symptoms like Jonah. Brother, he had the office case of symptoms I ever seen. Look here. Ever, now, he was, he was out on the ocean, his hands and feet tied behind him. And he was in the belly of the whale, probably several fathoms deep, laying in the vomit in the whale's belly on a stormy sea. Now, you talk about symptoms. He looked this way, it was whale's belly. That way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked was whale's belly. There's nobody in that bad of shape here. Look, what, look at the symptoms he had. But you know what he said? He said, there are lying vanities. I won't believe any of it. He said, Lord, turned over on his back, the vomit all around him, the seaweeds around his neck. He said, once more will I look to your holy temple. Oh, Amen. not look at the whale's belly or the circumstance, but look at your holy temple. Solomon, when Solomon dedicated that temple, he prayed. He said, Lord, if thy people be in trouble at any time and look to this holy place, then hear from heaven. And Jonah acted upon Solomon's prayer. Amen. And God, I don't know what he done. He put an oxygen tent down there or something. And he kept him alive for three days and nights. Now, we don't, we're not in that bad of shape. There's none of as bad off as Jonah was. That's right. Because here's the Holy Spirit here. We're not in the belly of the whale. We, we're not in that condition. But if Jonah, under those circumstances, could look to a temple that a human being prayed when he dedicated it, and the man that prayed backslid later, and God heard his prayers, how much more under this circumstance can we look towards heaven where Jesus sits at the right hand of God, ever living to make intercessions on our confession? My, my. I won't look at my tummy ache. I won't look at my heart beat funny. I won't look at my crippled hand, but I'll look towards the promise where he sits there, ever living to make intercessions. Amen. I want to show you something now. Show where God knows what he's talking about. Now, the people of Nineveh, that's a big city, about a half a million people, pretty near the size of St. Louis, Missouri. 
And they were heathens. They were in all kinds of sin. They worshipped animals and idols and everything. And they were, their occupation were fishermen. And so the whale was the god of the sea. So all of them was out about 11 o'clock fishing, all the fishermen pulling their nets out there in the sea. And the first thing you know, up come the sea god, the whale. Run up to the bank, licked out his tongue, and the prophet come walking right out on the bank. <laughs> sure, they repented. God knows what to do. God knows how to do things to people who wants to believe. See, Jonah wasn't out of the will of God. See, the whale God spit the prophet right out on the bank. Sure, they're going to believe his message. And there he come out. And Jesus said that, you know, that there was a greater than Jonah there. But notice what he said. Now, a little bit before we go into another subject. Look, Jesus said, they said, Master, we will see a sign. Three verses behind where I started reading. Master, we would see a sign. He said, a weak and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Is that right? Yeah. And he said, there will be no sign given that generation. Now listen, close. How many knows that as Scripture repeats itself constantly? We know it. Amen. And he said, there will be no sign given that weak, wicked, adulterous generation. That's this generation. There never has been so much in all the world of wickedness and adultery as there is right now. Perversion. Well, homosexual. Perversion. Women on the streets stripped. Everything. You, it's just terrible the way people are doing all over the world. And especially in the, in the States. And it's getting to be almost as bad in Canada. It's too bad. But it's true. That big nation, this little nation, is a pattern off of it. Don't take your pattern from man. Take your pattern from up here. Christ. Notice, and there they were. A wicked. He said, there will be no... Now listen close so you won't miss it. They will receive a sign. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and nights. They will receive that sign. What is the sign of the resurrection? You get it? Amen. That's exactly what we're getting now. The sign that he's not dead. He's raised from the dead and among Amen. us doing the same thing he did when he was shown her Amen. in the wicked and adulterous generation. See? We'll receive that sign. Then one more. Closing. He said, And the queen of the south shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now listen in closing. In the generation of Solomon, God gave a gift to the earth. And that was a gift of discernment. And it fell upon Solomon and all the people believed it with one heart. What if all the people they would believe? What if the Canada and the United States would believe their gift that God sent them, the Holy Ghost? What if all the people that profess to be Christians just believed it? Why, we wouldn't have to worry about Russia's atomic bombs and all them things. Well, we, you'd never be able to dig out with an atomic bomb. Well, the thing people are digging holes and down the states are going down in caves and making government offices. Well, that atomic bomb, the one they got now, that will burst the earth, I believe is three or four hundred feet deep and for 150 miles square. Well, if you were 10,000 feet under the earth, plumb down into the lava, it would break every bone in your body. You can't dig away from it, but we've got a bomb shelter. It's not made of steel, it's made of feathers under his wings. Amen. Be lifted up. That's right. When that before that bomb drops, we'll be in glory. What's the matter? And then they say we're crazy. Oh, if I am crazy, leave me like I am. I feel better this way. <laughs> so I, just, I like to stay this way. Now, notice... Now, in Solomon's time, everybody believed that gift. Oh, my. Everybody that wasn't going around saying, Oh, he's old sinless and he's old this and he's old that. No, there's all with one accord. They believed it. And how everybody coming by, through, uh, they didn't have uh, jet planes and things. Them days. They had to travel through camel caravans. And when they passed through, they'd say, Go down to the other parts of the world. Say, You ought to hear up in Palestine. They got a God up there, and that God is making Himself known through a man. Now, see, pagan worship is to prostrate yourself before the idol, the imaginary God, and believe that the imaginary God is talking to you. 
Christianity is vice versa. God takes a living man that prostrates himself before him and speaks his own words to the living man, not to an idol. Amen. This turns right around from pagan worship, idol worship, to Christian worship. Praise. Now, they said they got a man up there that their God that they worship speaks to that man with discernment. Oh, it went everywhere. All nations feared him. They sent in gifts and everything. No wars in the time of Solomon. No, he was... He was, they thought he was too smart. It wasn't him. It was God, the Holy Ghost in him that's making him smart. Now, that news came way down across the earth into the land of Sheba. And if you measure on your map, it's a long ways down there across the Sahara Desert. And this little pagan queen, she was a heathen. And people coming in saying, oh, you ought to see up there in Palestine such and such and such and such. My, how they thank God. About that. Now, you know, faith comes by what? Hearing the Word of God. Yeah. Now, the little woman would say, What? You know, God, in her, she believed that there was a God. And so when that faith began to touch her that there was one, she began to look for it. And everybody would come in when they come into her kingdom, camel caravans going to, you know, traders and so forth with silks and linens and so forth. And, produce and whatever they had coming through, why well, she'd call them into her palace and say, did you come through the way of Palestine? Yes. Is it so? It's so. It's so. You never, them people are one heart and one accord. you never seen such in your life. Their God has given them a gift and displaying it through a man. And they made that man their king. Oh my. They all believe it. Every one of them. Right. Well, did you get to see it? Yes. Is it so? Sure it's so. Oh, my. She wants to see it then, you know, when you hear about it. Now, she decided that she's, she got all the scrolls and she began to read what that God was. See, she is a heathen. And she began to read what Jehovah was. See, his nature. She said then, that must be Jehovah's nature that's displaying himself in this man. Because Jehovah, they say, is all wise. And he foretells things. So now, being a queen, she had a lot to go through with. She had to go over to her pagan priest and ask permission to go from her church. Well, you know what? I imagine that pagan priest said, you know, but you see, look here, girly, you're a queen. You can't go down with that illiterate bunch. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. You're a queen. And uh, you know what? Well, uh, 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 you know, it, uh, you would uh, get out of your own class if you got down. She said, but sir, I want to go. Something tells me I want to go. Oh, but uh, we, you can't do it, child. You cannot do it. Now, listen, we know they say all these kind of things up there. They crossed the Red Sea and it dried up and, and they rained bread out of heaven. But just legends. There's nothing to it. You hear that same old devil talking today. Yeah. The devil takes his man, but never his spirit. God never takes his spirit either. He might take his man, but the Holy Ghost is on Christ. Come back for the church to the end of the world to do the same thing. Notice now them big old scholars and things of that day and that great big old bunch of Pharisees, they still live. Their spirit's right on others, you see. And God's spirit still lives just the same, confirming his word going on. Depends on what you want to believe, that's all. Now, if we notice, then he said, now there's no such a thing as that. He said, now if there was anything to that, our idols, our church would be doing it. You get that the same thing today. Now, if there's anything to divine healing, the great so-and-so church would believe it. The great so-and-so church would do it, see. But, you know, God does things to suit himself. You don't have to ask anybody about it. He's the self-sufficient one. See, he don't have to ask nobody. So God was doing it. You know, a little heart begins to hunger for God. There's nothing going to stop it. And she said, sir, I'm going anyhow. Well, if you do, I'll give you a church letter. <laughs> said, you might as well give it. Well, I'm on my road. <laughs> so she, see, nothing going to stop a person to come to Christ that really believes him. When you hear the word of God and know it's in moving, there's nothing going to stop you. That's all. You're coming anyhow. And now remember, that little lady had a lot of difficult. Now I see her pack her camels, and here she thought of something. She said, now, wait a minute. If that's truly, if that gift is right, then I'm going to support it. So she got a lot of gold and frankincense and stuff and packed it on camels. She said, I'll take it with me, but if it isn't so, then I'll bring my money right back. That could teach Pentecostal people something. Yeah. Supporting meetings and re- meetings that, that hate the very thing that you stand for. Yeah. Let your own church go without. They do it in the States. I hope you Canadians don't do it, but they do it down there. And just to be popper, I give so-and-so to such-and-such. Oh, my, skim milk. Notice, now, here it was. 
She put everything together and she put it on her camels, all that money, thousands, times thousands of dollars worth of gold. And remember, Ishmael's children, the Arabs, they were robbers in the desert then. How easy it would have been for them to have fleet horse riders to ride right in and kill that bunch of little guards around that queen and, and take that money and fly away in five minutes. But you see, if you're determined to know God, you don't know no fear. Faith knows no fear. Is that right? You don't care what the doctor says, what anybody else says, you believe it. Amen. Amen. And she wasn't thinking about the robbers and this, that, and the other. She was thinking about getting over there and seeing God working in a man. And I remember, she, how long you think it took that woman? She didn't have an air-conditioned Cadillac to come in. No. She had to ride on the back of a camel. You know how long it taken the camel train to get from Sheba to Palestine? Three months. Ninety days to a hot Sahara desert. The hottest place in the world. On the back of a camel trying to come to see a gift of God. No wonder Jesus said she'll rise in the judgment and condemn this generation. See? She might have traveled by night. Daytime she laid up in the oasis and read the scrolls, the scriptures, to see what Jehovah was. She finally arrived at the gates. She didn't come say, well, like people do today, I'll go in and sit down. If he says one thing that's contrary to my belief, I'll get right up and walk out. That shows ignorance. No, that's right. But she come to stay till she was convinced. She'd read the Bible. She'd see what Jehovah meant and what Jehovah was and what Jehovah had promised. She wanted to see if that Jehovah they talked about was in that man. I imagine her priest told her, said, When I look at here, here's our great dag and here's our great idol here. She said, Yes, my great, 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 great grandmother served them. And they haven't done nothing but stood there as a statue all the time. They don't breathe. They don't move. There's nothing happened. And they say, This God's a living God doing something. Amen. That's Amen. it. Hallelujah. Amen. I feel kind of religious right now. Yeah. A living God. Amen. Not a dead one. What good's a God that could open the Red Sea if he can't do the same today? Amen. What's good as a God that could heal a leper in the days gone by if he can't do the same today? Amen. A historical God's no good if he isn't the same God today. That's right. He is the same God today. Amen. Yesterday, today, and forever. The same one. Only asking the same faith that they exercise. Now she's at the temple. She unpacks out there in a the temple yard, put up her tents, put her money back in a corner, put her little eunuchs around to guard it. And the next morning, maybe she got up early, her and her little uh, maids is with her, and they went in and sat down probably way back in the back of the church. And they sang all the songs and the trumpets blowed and everything. And after a while, Pastor Solomon came walking out. <laughs> How all the people said, oh, praise God. There's our pastor. And they walked out, Pastor Solomon on the platform. And she watched that day, the very things that she'd heard told, taking place. And day after day, she went studying the scrolls. She waited till her prayer card was called or whatever it was. She had to get up there. Her appointment was Solomon. And when she got up on the there before Solomon, the Bible said that there wasn't nothing hid from Solomon. He revealed everything that she wanted to know. Amen. Isn't that the same God Amen. that was in Christ that knows the secrets of the heart? Yeah. What did she say? She turned now, being a heathen, she turned and she said, all that I heard was right. And more than that, it had been done to her, you see. She was a witness of it. The same thing that Nathaniel and them saw last night in Jesus doing the same thing, revealing the secrets of the heart. Here, 2,500 years before, no, about 800 years before it happened, here stood Solomon doing the same thing that Christ did when he came. It's the same God. You see? What did she say? Blessed are those who are with you that see this gift working all the time. Blessed are the man that sets your daily and sees that happening all the time. And she become a believer. And Jesus said, she'll rise up in the last days and will condemn this generation because she came from the utmost parts of the earth to see the gift of God in operation and believed it. Amen. And people today won't walk across the street. That's right. They won't drive a nice car to the meeting. If anything, they'll make fun of it. 
And the very Christ predicted that a wicked and adulterous generation that would be seeking for signs would receive the sign of the resurrection. No wonder what was the matter. In closing, I'll say this. She's seen something real. That's what real believers want to see something real. Remember, the very thing that saves the real believer condemns and sends to hell the unbeliever. The very water that saved Noah drowned in the unbeliever. The same judgment that saved the believer killed the unbeliever. The same spirit today that the believer receives will condemn in the day of the judgment the unbeliever. See? Just a little story to my Indian brethren and all. I like to hunt. Oh, I just love to hunt. My, my, that's my second nature. My conversion never took that out of me. And I, I like to tell you a little story of hunting right here where God told me exactly, your pastor, Brother Bisco, remembers it? Brother Softman back there where he told me exactly what I was going to do, where I'd go, a caribou I'd get, where he'd be laying, a man would have a green checkered shirt on and would kill a grizzly bear before he got back. Is that right? Huh? that right, Brother Softman? Hundreds of people, I told him, went right there, and Eddie heard me tell it. The day before we left down there, two days later, he stood right there and seen every bit of it come just to pass. I told him, I said, the horns will be exactly 42 inches high. And the guide said, 42 exactly? He said, Brother Branham, after, he said, where's that grizzly bear up on top of this mountain? He said, Brother Branham, according to what you told me, that you're going to kill a grizzly bear before you get back to where Eddie Bisco was standing with a green checkered shirt on. And his wife had put it in a camp bag and he told me he didn't even have one. I said, well, then he's going to be somebody that's going to have it. Well, the, it's going to be there. And he had that green checkered shirt on. He said, before we get back there, I said that. He said, Brother Branham, I had a brother had epilepsy. And you told me when he had this fit again to jerk his shirt off and throw it in the fire and he wouldn't have it anymore. Well, he did, and God healed him of it. Now, he said, then I can't disbelieve it, but where's that bear going to be? I said, he's Jehovah Jireh. He can provide himself a bear to make his word come to pass. And when we're just about half a mile from him, being about three miles from him, was about a half a mile from him, I stand here and said, Brother Bram, we just got a half a mile further. Where's the bear? I said, don't you? I said, what's that, bud? There was a nine-foot silver-tipped grizzly standing up on top of the hill looking right at me. <laughs> He said, you, we got in 500 yards. said, Brother Bram, did you ever shoot a grizzly? I said, I shot many bear. He said, you better shoot him from here. I said, no. The vision said I was right up on him. He said, oh, Brother Bram. He said, shoot him in the back now. I said, because if you don't shoot him in the back, they're great fighters. I said, I know, but this one in the vision I shot in the heart. He said, oh. And I said, just keep going, bud. We went over another little coulee and come up, and then was right close to him, about 200 yards. I said, this is just right. I said, wait till it looks around. It looks like a big haystack. He turned and looked at me, had a little bitty rifle, and just as he turned and looked at me, I shot him right smack in the heart. And here he rolled over the hill like that, as hard as he could come, like that. And Bud stood there, turned white in the mouth. He said, Brother Branham, I didn't want him on my lap. And I said, did you? Did I? There, he said, now, if them horns are exactly 42 inches when I get down there, I'm going to have a screaming fit. I said, you better have it right here, because it's going to be that way. He said, I got to measure in my saddlebag. And we got down there, the vision said a... A little hand would hold the horns. I pulled up beside of Brother Eddie there. I said, now watch that boy hold that horn. And he went around, got that tape measure, brought it out, put it down the base head. That little hand, his boy, Blaine, held it, went up there. Bud said, mercy, Brother Brennan. Right smack on the nose, 42 inches. I said, Bud, he never fails. <laughs> he fails just, exactly, just exactly. Oh, he's God when we can see something real and genuine. That's what that queen wanted to see, something real. I used to hunt with a half-Indian brother of mine. His name is Bert Call. He's a Britoner and he lives up here, or Englishman lives up in New Hampshire. Great hunter. I loved to hunt with him. He didn't have to fool about letting him get lost. He knowed his way back. And we, but he was the meanest man I ever seen in my life. That guy was really wicked. He had eyes like a lizard. And he always looked at me in them lizard eyes and scared me to death anyhow. But he, uh, he used to say to me, he used to shoot little fawns, you know, little baby fawns. Now, it's all right. I've killed fawns. When, if the law says you can kill a fawn, kill it. That's all right. Abraham killed a calf and fed it to God. There's nothing the size of anything or the sex of it. But just to kill them to be mean, that's wrong. You shouldn't do just kill to be mean. That's one thing about the Indian. The reason he is the great conservationist we ever had, he took just what he had to use. He caught more, he turned it loose. The white man was a murderer. He went out and shot the buffaloes out and so forth for targets. That's the bad bad guy. Is doing things like that. But Bert used to shoot him just for fun to make me, make me feel bad. He said, you preachers are chicken-hearted. So that's what's, you know, what I, is that word used up here, chicken-hearted? Chicken-hearted. So that, that's what's the matter with you preachers. 
So one day I went up there and he had made him a little whistle to make it sound like a little baby fawn without a little brrr, the, uh, crying, like it's crying for its mammy. And I said, Bert, you, you wouldn't do that. He said, oh, you chicken-hearted preacher. He said, Billy, you'd be a good hunter if you wasn't a preacher. But I had to get his game out every fall. Anyhow, you see, so I, I just let him go. So I said, Bert, you wouldn't do that. He said, what's wrong with killing a fawn? I said, nothing. But just to shoot it, to leave it lay there. Go over and shoot another and just to act mean. I said, that's, that's bad, Bert. You shouldn't do that. That will grow up into a big buck someday. Maybe a doe. Have many other deers. You might have children someday wanted to hunt. So we're, nah, nonsense, he said. Just as wicked as he could be. So that day was way late, and we had the white-tailed deer up there. And you talk about Houdini being a escape artist. He's an amateur for one of them. Boy, he'd be gone like that. You had to be fast and quick in a dead shot to hit him. And then after, after they'd been shot at a few times, so it was kind of late in the season. And we'd hunted all morning, not even a track, about six or eight inches of snow. We always packed a thermos jug full of hot chocolate, where if we got caught out in a storm at night or something, we'd keep going all right. So we had a sandwich in our coat. And about 11 o'clock, and I thought, well, we hadn't even seen a track or nothing. Moonlight nights, and they'll eat at nighttime, you know, feed and go in the day, lay under brush piles back in the heavy timbers. And so we was getting up nearly timber line. And I thought maybe Bert was leading the way, and we'd get up on top of the mountain, and he'd separate and go one way and me the other, and we'd come around. Maybe we'd get in that night or the next morning one, and we killed a deer. We'd know where to go get him and so forth, take a horse and go after him. So then... Uh, I thought he'd, he'd come to a little opening about three or four times the size of this building here, and he kind of hunkered down on a snowdrift, kind of hunkered. That word ain't used here, is it? <laughs> I'm a southerner. In other words, he squatted, squatted down like this. And he, uh, he got down there, and he went to get back in his coat. I thought he was going to get his sandwich, and so I went in after mine. I thought, well, we'll separate here. I'll go one way and he the other and hunt back this afternoon. And he reached back, and he pulled out this little whistle. I said, now, Bert, he looked at me, them lizard eyes looking at me, and um, Kind of sneer, that little snarling laugh on his face. And he pulled out that little whistle like that. And he blew it. And when he did, a great big doe stood up just across the way. Across that little opening. I thought, uh-oh. Oh, she made a bad move then. Now, that's strange. They won't do that usually. You Indian brother know that when they're hunting. And then he looked at me in them lizard eyes. He laughed. And he blew it again. And that mother doe walked right straight out into that opening. Now, that's altogether strange for him there to do that. Now, a doe is a mother deer, you know. I could see her great, I could close enough to see her big eyes and big ears sticking up so graceful. She walked right out there. Now, what was the matter? She wasn't putting on a show. She was a mother. She was born a mother. The instinct of mother was in her. And her baby was crying. She wasn't cared about fearing anything. She was coming to find her baby. And we never pair, carry a shell in a barrel. So he put a shell up, a 30 old 680 grain mushroom bullet, mushroom. He pulled it up there, and he's a dead shot. And when the, his Model 70 Winchester, and when he pulled the lever down like that, the click of the gun, the deer spooked. Look. And she spotted the hunter. But she never run. Now you know that's strange. But she was a mother. Her baby was in trouble and she was born a mother. And she was hunting for her baby. And she looked at that hunter and she big nose up, looking like that, trying to find her baby. He, she heard a cry. She wasn't putting on an act. It was genuine. She was a mother. I see him level down a dead shot. And I thought, oh my, he'll blow her heart plumb through the other side. How can he deceive her like that? How can he be so mean as to do that? Blowing that whistle and get that mother deer out here and shoot her. Doubtful he'd ever take her in. And I thought, that loyal heart of that deer will be blowed out of her. And I looked and I see him leveling down right. I thought as soon as that crosshair and that scope come right across that loyal heart, it'd blow it plumb through her. I turned my back. I couldn't look at it. I started praying. I said, Heavenly Father, how can he do it? How can he do it, Lord? And he won't listen to me talking about you. I said, how can he do it? And I was there kind of praying to myself behind a bush. I listened for the gun to fire any minute, but it didn't fire. I waited. It didn't fire. And I looked around and he's going like this. Sorry. He couldn't hold it no more. He looked around, the great big tears running down his cheeks. His black Indian hair fell down his face. He threw the gun down on the bush. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. Oh, 
What was it? He saw something real. He saw something that wasn't put on, artificial. He saw the real display of motherhood after her baby, something that was genuine. Oh, God, make all of us that kind of a Christian. How many of you would like to be the kind of a Christian that that dear was a mother? Your heart, danger, nothing else. See something great. See something that's real. Then God, oh, may his blessings. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Each one of you in your own heart pray. Say, God, make me that kind of a Christian. Just silently to yourself. Oh, God, our Father, grant unto thy servants, O Father, pardoning of sin. Hear us as we cry. Bless us now. Reveal our sins to our hearts and make us real Christians. Let grace and mercy abound in our hearts. Grant it, Lord. They saw something real, and they were ready then. They saw something that could not be manufactured. It had to be something that was real. It wasn't a manufactured thing. And we've got a God tonight. That man is a deacon in a church, right there on that snowbank, with his arms wrapped around my frozen pants legs. He said, Billy, there's got to be a God somewhere. I said, is there a God that can make me a Christian as much as that dear is a mother? I said, yes, Bert. His name is Jesus. Will you receive him? He said, with all my heart, Billy. I received him. I knelt down in the snow, took the shell out of his gun, put my arm around his neck. There, praying together, he received Jesus as his Savior. That's been about 20 years ago. He's a faithful member of the body of Christ now. Wonderful, brother. Now, while we're praying, how many here in divine presence with your heads bowed would say, I would like to be that kind of a Christian? Maybe you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. And you'd say, God, be merciful to me. I've always wanted to be a Christian, but really I've never seen nothing. It would just make me nothing real like that. But I really believe that there is a God, and I want to accept him as my Savior. Will you raise your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. God bless you, sir. Another, God bless you, lady. And God bless you. God bless you. 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 God bless you back there, lady. Some another. Now, you may be a member of a church. I'm not talking about membership. I'm talking about it's you being a Christian, genuine. Death would mean nothing to you. You love Jesus so that he's just, you're, you love him like a mother would love her baby. And you'll, you talk about the love that he has for you. He said, can a mother forget her suckling babe? He said, she might, but I can't forget you. Your names are engraved on the palms of my hand. Now the queen of the south come to see the wisdom of Solomon. Here was Jesus after all these hundreds of years was doing the same thing. And they, he said, today she come to hear Solomon. And here was he with the same gift, only greater, and promised that in this day they would receive the sign of the resurrection. God, make us real. Pray now. God be with you. Just pray just silently to yourself, saying, Be merciful, Lord. I now repent of all my sins. I believe on him. God bless you. Trusting that it's based in your heart. Now, raise your heads. Look this way. I am your brother. I've come to tell you the truth. The God that gave a gift to Solomon is the same God tonight. Jesus stood there being God, manifest in the flesh and showed the people. Now the Bible predicts that in the last day, the Spirit of God will manifest itself in the same way just before the coming of the Son of God. It would be like it was at Sodom. You believe that? Yes. Now, let the God that you have accepted as your personal Savior. Let him speak tonight. How many of you people here that I'm going to omit the prayer cards right at this time? 
How many people here that doesn't have a prayer card? Now, you do not have a prayer card, and you believe that God will heal you. Raise up your hand and say, I will believe you. All right? Now, you look this way just a moment. Being a stranger to you. Now, if Jesus stood here tonight wearing this same suit that he gave me years ago. Now, if you come to him and you said, Lord, will you heal me? He couldn't do it. He's already did it. You believe that, don't you? By his stripes. But he could prove to you that he was Christ. And the only way you know it, not the way he's dressed, not the scars on him, but the ministry he would have, he would be the Word. And the Bible said the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Is that right? Now, how many knows that's true? Say, Amen. Amen. Now, the Bible said that Jesus now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Is that right? Now, if he's the same high priest, how about your faith touching him? And watch and see. Now, if I'm... Listen. Do you believe he would have anything to do with a hypocrite? Jesus? No, sir. Do you believe he'd associate himself in lies? Not our God. No. But our God is responsible for his word. Is that right? Yes. And humbly, he's permitting this to be done, not because he has to, but to show the people that he is God and keeps his promise, God. Some of you people back there, you Anglo-Saxon, do you believe it with all your heart? Raise up your hand and say, I believe it. For I see anything real done, I believe it. The Indian people, you believe with all your heart? Raise up your hand. Now, now again, I'm going to ask you, you without a prayer card... Raise up your hand. Now, you haven't got a prayer card. Raise up your hand, the white people back there. All right? Now, I want you to pray. You people back there, pray and say, Lord Jesus, that preacher doesn't know me. But you know me. Now, you can take your hand down and pray. And say, Lord Jesus, if you're a high priest, you let me touch you. And then you turn around like the woman that touched his garment. And he turned around and said, who touched me? And Paul or Peter said, Lord, he rebuked him, all's touching you. He said, but I perceive that I got weak. Virtue, strength went from him. Now, if one little woman touched him using the gift of God, if one little woman touched him causing him to get weak, what about me, a sinner, saved by grace? But what did he say? The works that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do. Now, the King James says greater, but there, in the original translation, nothing could be greater. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he stopped nature, he done everything. But more than this shall you do all around the world, see? For I go to the Father. Now, you pray. You know what's wrong with you, and you pray. And that, if you've never seen nothing real done, and he will appear here tonight in his presence. Now, not me. And my, no matter how much gift I have, you have to have faith, too. Because it's your faith that operates it. It's not me. The woman, she touched his garment and he got weak. That was a woman using God's gift. But when he went away from the house of Lazarus and went away and, and come back and raised up a man who had been dead four days, he never said he got weak then. That was God using his gift. You believe that? Because he said at the grave, you know, I, I thank the Father's already heard me for, for these. I said it. See, he said, I do nothing to the Father. Show me. That's the reason he didn't go back when they sent for him. I pray. If I be God's servant, now if anybody thinks this is false, come up here and do it. Let's see you do it. If it's false. Pretty quiet. Then it isn't. It's of God. It's God's Bible. Now you believe. And just believe now. All I'm an... Nervous, this is 11 straight meetings for me, and I'm just wore out. You know it. Night after night, every night, strength, virtue, and through the day, he'll send me down on the corner and say, stand here. There'll be a guy come by on a wheelchair. That's the big visions. These are the little ones. You're causing these. That's the one that God gives. Say, this man comes by, and he did a certain thing at a certain time. He'll be pressing around the corner. Just speak to him and raise him up out of the chair and go on. Let nobody know who does it. You hear it appear in papers and things like that. Nobody knows who it is. He sends me down there and says, do this, see. That's God using his gift. Now you do it. You use God's gift and say, Great high priest of God, let me touch you, and you use Brother Bram to speak to me. And if you'll just tell me what's my trouble and what this or something that in my heart I'm praying for, I'll believe with all my heart. And then you'll be able to say, like the mother dear, like you'll see something real, like 
Bert calls Saul. Now here, here, here it is. Thank you, Lord. Look over this way. How many have seen that picture on the paper tonight? You see it? Uh, did he show it here? Yes, sir. All right. You know that pillar of fire you saw on the paper? There it is. You stand right there. It's over a little woman sitting way back here towards the back. A little lady. She's wearing glasses. She's kind of thin. She's suffering with an allergy. Do you believe, sister? You put up your hand a few minutes ago. You didn't have a prayer card. You don't got to have a prayer card, do you? Stand up on your feet. Is that what you're suffering with? If that's right, raise up your hand. And if I'm a stranger to you, wave your hand like this. I want to ask you something. Right now, you feel a real sweet feeling, don't you? Just real. I'm looking right at that pillar of fire circling right around that woman right now. Your faith has made you whole. Jesus Christ. Now, do you believe? 